o'clock. Um, we're here under rather false pretenses uh, because uh, the original team uh, that was due to talk about global value change, dynamics and uncertainty in a confused world order suffered from both dynamics and confusion and various other things. Thomas Holt could not come because his parents are really ill and Hafiz Mirza fell over and broke his uh, um, elbow. So, what do we do when we have, when a, when a team has problems? It brings on substitutes. And we have got two of the best substitutes you can imagine. We've got Sariana London and Ari Van Ash here as substitutes. So they save the day. So we, we are hoping to uh, produce a coherent uh, program under conditions of extreme uncertainty and ambiguity and all the rest of it. So here we are to talk about global value chains. Our other disaster is one of our presenters has not shown up yet. So um, we, you can see that we, we are really operating in a world of uncertainty and, and that very much fits what we're doing. But the program is as follows. I will be talking about this in a second. Uh, I'm the interim chairman, as Thomas couldn't make it, and then it's going to be followed by Ari talking about decoupling China from the U.S. value chain, and Sariana talking about uncertainty in a confused world order with special reference to Germany and Europe. Okay, so I will start. Um, when, when I was asked to do this, I was also looking at this issue of VUCA. I don't know how many of you are familiar uh, with VUCA. VUCA is originally a U.S. military term for dealing with situations that the military finds itself in. And the, the four acronyms of VUCA are volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And it struck me that this was a really good means of trying to look at the structure of global value chains under these extreme and changing conditions. Now, the other part of the jargon here that, that I use is, is a bit of my own jargon, which is the global factory. And there once was a question on a Cambridge history paper, and the, came, the question was, the Holy Roman Empire was not holy, it was not Roman, and it was not an empire. Discuss. And the global factory is not global, and it's not a factory. It's the idea, the idea of the global factory is the coordination of activities by a distributed multinational enterprise. So what I'm going to try and do is look at the configuration of global value chains or supply chains if you prefer, under conditions of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And what, I, what the idea of this is, is to look at the theoretical drivers of distributed network multinational enterprises, and to look at the reaction of these fundamental drivers in terms of the changes in the, the arrival or the changes or the increase, if you like, of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So this is a really stripped-down version of how we might apply theory to a situation of VUCA. So what I've got here are the three, in my mind, the three key determinants of the structure and coordination of the global factory. The internalization decision, looking at the split between externalized activities, outsourced activities, and activities that are controlled by the multinational enterprise. The location decision, looking at how this affects location of the different activities. And the third one is the coordination or the governance or the information role of multinationals.
And so what I've tried to do is look at each of these drivers, each of these theoretical underpinnings, and look at what the impact of these various external factors are. So you can regard this, this first matrix, you can regard these either as conjectures arising from the theory, or you can regard them as predictions, which are, as you'll see, all testable, all subject to empirical evidence, empirical re uh, refutation, or you can re regard them as the ravings of a madman. The choice is, is yours. So essentially what I've tried to do then is to look at the key theoretical drivers and to look at the impact on, on these theoretical drivers of these external conditions and then try to see how this affects management and strategy and decision making in distributed multinational enterprises. So if we look at each, each of these cells in the matrix, each of these cells has, if you like, a prediction or, well, we, prediction's too strong, has an argument about how that particular factor will protect, affect that particular theoretical driver and then how that would work out in management decision making. So if we take the first, we take the first column of internalization, what would we expect? the impact of increased volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity to be on the configuration and the structure and the management of multinational enterprises. If we have increased volatility, you can argue that the reaction of the company will be to increase its, can try to increase its control, try to increase um, the control of the firm over its various activities. It, would, it, it might try to decrease outsourcing, it might try to increase management control of those things that are absolutely core to its existence to protect itself against increased volatility. With uncertainty, we might uh, we, it depends where the sources of the volatility and the, and the uncertainty are, of course. Because you might, if the uncertainty is coming from the external environment, you might try to offset that by letting somebody else handle the uncertainty. If the uncertainty is coming from the structure of the company itself, then you might want to increase uh, the internalization of those activities. Complexity... The issue is here, who bears the cost of the complexity? Is this borne by the, the multinational, the focal firm, the organizing firm, the orchestrating firm? Or can you, as it were, subcontract the problems of complexity to your various outsourced activities? And if the complexity arises from different national environments or different environments, that you're operating in, then you might wish to allow the local people who are closer to the issue of the complexity to deal with that and therefore to make this much more of a network type operation than an internalized hierarchical operation. With ambiguity, you can see each of the you can see each of these cells, you can argue about. You can argue about how each of these cells will work, depending where the ambiguity or the complexity is coming from, right? But essentially, what we have to do is to see how those factors affect the key drivers of the system. And the system is driven by internalization, location, and governance issues. So it's possible to say, well, all you're doing is providing a conjecture about what each of these cells would look like, and I would accept that. But what we can do with each of these is to confront it with evidence and to see how far the theory explains this. And to do that, we really need to know where the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity is coming from. So the, 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 this is not a simple one-way thing. Increases in, in these VUCA factors will have differential effects 
on internalization of different elements of the multinational system. And to, to understand how that will work, we both need to understand the external drivers, where, this, where these elements are coming from, and the structure of the company to see how the company will react to that. When we look at the second factor, when we look at location, it's possibly easier to think in terms of how companies will react in terms of the number of locations, the spread of locations, and to some extent the overlap between locations. So if we have extreme volatility, we might argue that what you need to respond to volatility is multiple sourcing. You might, need, might, might have the kind of strategy that people have called China plus one or China plus X, where you don't put all your eggs in the one basket of China, but you have competing and different locations to absorb the volatility. And if something goes wrong in one place, then you have alternative sources of supply. So that could lead, again, to incre increased complexity, which is something I'll talk about in a minute. Where we have uncertainty, you might, the, there could be an argument that you increase the number of locations as insurance against this uncertainty. You, you might argue that if you're unsure where the problem is, a number of locations, well, some of them are going to be okay, so you could uh, spread that. So locational flexibility becomes a really important issue when you've got a volatile external environment and uncertain external environment. With complexity, this might have to do with the degree of embeddedness of the firm. How far is the firm embedded in particular locations in order to pick up uh, the complexity of the external environment? And finally, with ambiguity, you might, uh, you might have an argument that you uh, decrease the number of locations in order to control it and to centralize activities to reduce this ambiguity. So you could argue that that might lead to higher hierarchical operation, increased hierarchical operation. So you can see that the, the, the answers don't kind of completely fall out. In each of these cells there are arguments about how these particular factors will affect the key drivers. But what, I, what I've got here, and what I'm arguing I've got here, is an analytical engine to deal with the different impacts on the firm, given where the problems of VUCA are coming from and the existing structure of the firm. The other factor that's absolutely important, the third key theoretical driver, you could call different things. You can call this the coordination needs. Because if we're talking about a networked multinational, then increases in coordination problems are going to increase costs and increase problems for the firm. You can argue this is also very much an information story. Because the firm, in order to, to to structure its strategy in order to manage its internalization versus externalization and its location strategy needs to have information about where the sources of the problems are coming from and how to deal with it. You could also argue that this is a governance factor, that we're also talking about the governance of the network structure and how that will change over time. So I've called this coordination needs. You can see what I'm doing here is tr trying to get a coherent theoretical handle on how we deal and how firms should deal with changes in the external environment through VUCA. With volatility, what we need here, is, uh, uh, the answer to all of this, of course, is collect more information. The, the, the answer to all of these things is we need information on where where the problems are coming from. But with volatility, we need to collect the information and transmit and coordinate this information from the center. So we know each of our units' 
in the uh, global factory in the system knows where how to cope with the uh, volatility where it's coming from what the strategies are and so on. with uncertainty it's much more about the local part and the central part being able to communicate to get a fix on information and communicate it both to and from the center with complexity again you need to co uh, collect information but the particular parts of the multinational that would have access to this first are the periphery. So that suggests a kind of information structure from the periphery inwards. And with ambiguity, we need a careful analysis and assessment of the information coordinated through the organization. So these are initial thoughts about how we might have a theory of the reaction of multinational firms to increases in the problems of the world economy arising from these VUCA factors. Uh, you can see it's a very early stage, but what, the, what, what I've tried to do is to, is to show that the, um, the problems and the very difficult problems that are summed up by VUCA, we do have analytical engines to be able to deal with it. We do have the theory to be able to deal with it. What we don't necessarily have is the right kind of information to test this theory and to, within each cell, to show how the different balance of the uh, factors will alter the structure of the global factory. So another way of looking at this is to say this is the start of a research program to try and figure out how over time multinationals will react to these increased problems from the external environment under these various headings. So I'll stop there. We'll take questions at the end. The four of us will sit there and we'll take questions at the end and hand over to Peter if he can. So while Peter is sorting that out, it's deserving of an apology. Elaine Lebecki called a Jibs editor's meeting. Um, when we arrived here, and uh, I said that it's going to be impossible um, because of uncertainties and ambiguities and complexities in getting into the city to the restaurant, which happened and were realised, and I am um, late. So, so I've taken a particular view here that, um, look, the history of IB has been one of, initially there was this interest in the macro environment and, and a lot of work was done on how that macro environment conditioned the behaviour of firms. So there was the interest in how exchange rates and so on affected firms' international activity. In the early, mid-1990s, there was this significant change within the field to looking at the performance implications of strategy. So the firm was opened up and IB took an interest in what was going on in the firm and particularly how those strategies impacted performance. Look, maybe I'm suggesting that we need to go back and more seriously consider the macro environment again, and not just 
how the microenvironment impacts the behaviour of firms. But the firms that we know a lot about might be conditioning that environment in particular ways that we should know more about because some of the influences or some of the impacts of the firms that we deal with might be creating a lot of the issues that the, the, popu that the public and governments are concerned about. And I've just picked two. What to, in particular, I mean, this is more now taking the phenomenological view that IB takes an interest in pheno uh, phenomena that are going on. And I've just thought about maybe two. One is waste. I don't know if it's the same in your country as mine, but we have these incredibly creative television shows and media campaigns on waste and what is going on with waste. And the second is something that we don't normally think about, and that's the low inflation environment that we live in today. I mean, most of our economies, particularly the advanced economies, are struggling with a phenomenon that we've not experienced before, and our governments are experimenting with how to, to get out of these situations. And um, when, I, when I listen to the debate about these things, I'm thinking, well, you know, if, if smart economists don't have answers to a lot of these, these questions, what, what, is, what is really going on in our world? So I've only got two slides. And the first slide talks about a lot of traditional things like our interest is in IB, the internationalisation of production. Right? And that's changing. It always will change because our interest is firms in markets. And if markets are changing, firms are going to have to change their organisational forms and their strategies to deal in those changing markets. So markets are changing and, they, and we, we now are in a more acute, seemingly geopolitical context than we have been for a while. So there's, there's something going on with markets and our geopolitical context. And for some time now, the value chain has become one of our centres of attention. Right? It's not just the firm anymore, it's firms and it's also the value chain. Right, which includes the behaviour of many firms uh, who are organised very differently, who are in different parts of the world. And what that brings to us is this issue of location. Clearly, core, IB, or, uh, core to IB is location. It always has been. So, and when we talk about location, you can't avoid talking about geopolitical context because all those locations have different politics and sociologies and so on. So this is core IB, it's the location decision remains fundamental and in, in that location decision uh, issues of geopolitical uncertainties and so on really may be considered. So the geopolitical context is critical, it's ele we have this elevated interest in global value chains I mean, we heard this morning at another one of these sessions what should be our unit of analysis, uh, and we've got a selection if we think about the value chain. But um, maybe one is the task or the activity. And if, if it is that, then one issue that comes to my, my, my mind is, okay, whatever goes on in the value chain in all of those different locations, wherever they may be, there are externalities created. Right? There are impacts on third parties not, not party to that, that transaction. And, and some of those externalities are going to be positive and some of those externalities will be negative. And as an IB field, I think it behoves us to take a greater interest in those externalities, which we traditionally don't do. And I'm not sure the economists do it either, but it's those externalities that are probably creating a lot of the negative effects that we observe, like the wastes. Now, if they are, I live in the bottom end of the South Pacific, 
So we don't end up with these islands of plastic waste that float around the Pacific. But there are massive islands of plastic waste floating around the Pacific, some of which are bigger than most of those island nations. Where did that come from? Right? We don't really know. Right? But they came from somewhere, and someone should explain why that happened. Right? So location is important. The activities of firms producing whatever they're producing in different parts of the world is important. And some of those activities are going to produce negative externalities. Who's going to pay for those things? So, you know, it's a long time since I've been an economist, but orthodox economics would say that this is where government policy enters. Well, that's a problem with these things because we're dealing with value chains across borders. Um, and so which governments are going to institute policy that's going to uh, address these externalities? Will there be coordinated policies across countries? Unlikely. Will there be some transnational policy? Possible, but you know, it's going to take a lot of negotiation to get that. So one of my messages is that we really need to think about global value chains at, at other levels, about the activities that are going on in these, about the impacts of those activities wherever they're created and even beyond wherever they're created, like islands of plastic in the South Pacific. And the next issue is, is government the best institution to look for remedies for these things? And maybe it's not. Maybe we should think about the firm as being the most appropriate institution to target for addressing these externalities that they and others are creating. So, so we've got firms that do business, that create issues, and maybe we should be starting to look back at the, to those firms to address some of these negative externalities. Clearly there are positive externalities that are created in chains, but that would be another story. The other issue is this thing of inflation, right? We don't think of inflation normally in IB, but by Jove, governments are thinking about inflation. They have to, right? Because their economies are not growing and the orthodoxy in economics would say you need some degree of inflation, right? Um, and, and, you know, 2%, 3% inflation is seen as somewhat of the norm, right, to create reasonable growth in advanced economies, but we haven't got that. Right? And in a lot of places, we've got zero inflation or, or, or even worse. So how do we deal with this? And is this important for IB people? Well, if we look at IB, clearly in IB, efficiency in the global value chain um, it is, it searches out locations and suppliers who are able to deliver these activities, these tasks, at the, most, at the lowest possible cost to you know, subject to specification. So we work in, or our firms work in an efficiency imperative. And so should they, right? We heard this morning that, that you know, um, shareholders and others are going to demand this. How can we stop? How can we ever um, moderate or stop shareholders being interested in the maximisation of their, their wealth and their returns through these markets? If we think of the worldwide there's a lot of capacity worldwide. There's a lot of capacity. And maybe we've only just scratched the surface of that capacity. Right? And what does this really mean? What does this mean uh, when, when we think of global value chains? So a global value chain that might exist at the moment is probably not optimum, optimal. There probably will be better suppliers and in, in other locations or those locations that are able to produce whatever they produce for that chain at a lower cost subject to specification. Right? So we've got a lot of capacity in the world. Maybe, maybe what's happening here is, and I don't know, but this is, this is a research prospect, maybe, maybe this low inflation context we live in is partially explained 
by the nature of the global value chain and its imperatives. That would be really interesting. Right? If that were the case, then we should look at firms, our firms, as possible explanations for what's going on in the macro context that governments are having a lot of difficulty in understanding and in seeking instruments to remedy. So the relationship between capacity in the system, the global system, the global production system, and, and inflation, and inflation across borders would be a worthy topic for us. And particularly now as we and IB with a new journal in, in, in business policy are going to, should be taking an interest in. As I said before, national policy responses are seemingly experimental, but it seems that most of the, the policy responses are reliant on traditional orthodox economic theorising. So we've got increasing uncertainties caused by the environment that we now live in, low inflation, low growth, zero, even negative interest rates. So we've got a macro context that firms are struggling to take decisions in because they're not used to this context. They're used to contexts with some inflation, with positive interest rates, right, and so on. So firms are taking decisions in, a, in an environmental, macro environmental context that's different from what they were used to. They're taking decisions um, that are based on efficiency imperatives, which they always have. And maybe, maybe, maybe that could be aggravating, that macro context in which they're struggling to take decisions in. So we need to know more in IB about the consequences of organising around global value chains. These are not just firms producing, these are firms within systems producing with unrestricted capacities in a global environment subject to a particular um, objective function and maybe they are creating their own problems in the, creating the uncertainties that, uh, and complexities that Peter has just spoken about um, and struggling to do so. So uh, that's, my, that's my story. It's firms doing what firms should do and what we understand that they do and they do do it well. There are increasing numbers of those firms doing much the same. They're creating additional capacity in a world. We live in a world seemingly with unlimited capacity and that does generate a low inflation environment. And that low inflation environment is creating problems for those same firms and for lots of other constituencies producing lots and lots of negative externalities. So it's, it's just a call to extend our interest into the macro environment, taking what we do know um, in IB theory and maybe assisting those economists in their theorising on how better to deal with this new environment. And I do apologise for being late. Thank you. So uh, we started the session today with a, a presentation by Peter Buckley who talked about um, VUCA and how understanding VUCA is important uh, to also understand the organization of global value chains. And then we had Peter Leach who um, came and indicated that we should be focusing more on tasks and that we should be also thinking about how changing organizations of global value chains has implications for understanding the macro environment. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one application, which is the Sino-US trade war, uh, to uh, try to think a bit about what uh, the implications is of China's positioning global value chains on the potential outcome of this uh, trade war. Okay? Um, so, um, so here we've got a, kind of a picture that shows uh, um, uh, Donald Trump who's decoupling the Chinese train. Uh, so um, uh, there's a lot of economists right now that are starting to say that maybe the end game of this uh, Sino-US trade war is 
uh, decoupling of value chains, and so mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll get a bit more into that as well. So so when we think about the Sino-U.S. trade war, um, uh, we always obviously think about uh, Donald Trump, um, but actually the origin of the trade war uh, goes uh, back much further. So uh, there have been concerns about the Chinese economy for uh, quite a while. These uh, concerns. Uh, existed in the United States, but also in Canada, also in Europe, in many other countries, where there is the idea that the uh, Chinese system is um, uh, unfairly advantageous towards uh, Chinese companies, not only in the local markets, but also when these firms uh, internationalize. And so some of these concerns that, that we hear a lot about is uh, the fact that uh, foreign firms, when they enter into the Chinese market, that they have to um, uh, transfer technology to their joint venture partner. Other people are concerned about the fact that uh, U.S. companies pay too little uh, for technology licenses. Uh, there are concerns that in certain key industries, foreign firms are not allowed to operate. Uh, uh, there are concerns about uh, Chinese industrial policy where there are uh, big subsidies being given uh, to state-owned enterprises and uh, private enterprises uh, through China's banking system. There's concerns about predatory outward investment, um, uh, cyber theft, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is kind of the concerns where, uh, that Donald Trump also built on when he decided to start a trade war where uh, tariffs on average in 2017 on Chinese imports were 3.1%. Uh, but then in 2018, um, uh, uh, President Trump decided to put uh, tariffs, uh, uh, higher tariffs on certain uh, imports from China for national security reasons, which brought the average up to 12.4%. China retaliated uh, by putting their own tariffs. The um, uh, United States retaliated again. It went up to 18%. There was another couple of rounds of retaliations, and right now we're at about 26%. Uh, so, uh, and of course, this is on the uh, U.S. import side. Uh, so, but on the exports toward China, the, um, the the tariffs are around the same. So, the logic behind this increase in tariffs is that uh, Donald Trump is trying to put. Uh, economic pressure onto the Chinese government, where the idea is that if you put tariffs, you are making the companies operating in China less competitive, uh, their prices are going to start going up, and so consumers in the United States are going to say, well, these products are getting more expensive, let's substitute away toward products from other countries, uh, and then this then would lead to a reduction in production and employment uh, in China. Some companies, as Peter Buckley also indicated, some companies uh, might kind of find that um, they have other sources of where they can make products, so they might be moving uh, production away. And so this puts a lot of economic pressure on the Chinese government, and this would then force them to um, uh, change their um, uh, economic system in China. Okay. Now, depending on who you talk to, uh, some people might say that actually the pressure on the Chinese government is very big, and other people will say actually that the pressure is not as big. So if you look at tweets of uh, Donald Trump, he will say that ultimately uh, there is no reason for the U.S. consumer to pay the tariffs. Uh, all the hurt will be on China, uh, and this is because the tariffs can be completely avoided if you buy from a non-tariff country or you buy the product inside the United States. Um, uh, that is zero tariffs because many t tariff companies will be leaving uh, China for Vietnam or to other countries. So his idea is these tariffs are making uh, Chinese companies or companies in China so uncompetitive that uh, there will be uh, a substitution towards sourcing from other countries. Okay. Other people have been saying, well, this is just not the case. I mean, so here is a statement of the footwear distributors and retailers of America. So these are all the big footwear uh, producers like Nike and uh, New Balance and, and many other uh, companies. And so they uh, indicate that um, there have been suggestions that industries should quickly shift sourcing to countries other than China in the wake of these additional tariff threats. While our industry has been moving away from China for some time now because wages are going up uh, significantly, Footwear is a very capital-intensive industry with years of planning required to make sourcing decisions, and companies cannot simply move factories to adjust to these changes. If you listen to what the CEO of Walmart said, this was the same concern that they were putting up. So, so a question that kind of comes up then is, well, how substitutable are Chinese exports? Um, uh, and does all this depend on China's position in 
uh, global value chains. And so the argument I would make is that it matters uh, a lot. So this is a question that economists have been looking at quite a bit, looking at trade elasticities, uh, but they actually have not been taking into account very much global value chains. So the argument that economists have been making is that um, certain products are more differentiated and so it's more difficult to substitute uh, for each other while others are more homogenized and these are more easily substitutable and so they've been really looking at the characteristics of the products. In international business however there has been a significant literature on organizational flexibility uh, together with Kogut uh, and Kulati Lapka and other people basing on uh, real options theory where you might want to create a China plus one strategy where you've got uh, companies having operations in different countries and if there's a shock hitting one country you can just move production to the other country. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so this production switching um, is very important, but it depends on how easy it is to switch production. And one could make the argument that uh, more routine activities or tasks are more easily moved from one factory to another factory uh, than the more differentiated tasks um, uh, where you need a very specific capability. So, so one could make the argument that if you take the smile of value creation, um, but these standardized services here at the bottom are services that are footloose and easily substitutable and as you kind of move towards these uh, ends of the, the smile curve then actually you start finding out that they are becoming less substitutable. In addition to that, if you are a country that is specializing in final assembly, which is often kind of one of these activities here, and you're selling to the United States, then you're being hit directly by tariffs the more you start moving upstream, ultimately you're not directly being affected anymore and it actually allows you to get out as well. Now all this is really important because when we look at China, uh, for anybody that's been going there in the last 30 years, China today is not the same as China 30 years ago. When China opened up in the 1980s, they opened up and started specializing in very labor intensive assembly activities which were really kind of at the bottom of the chain. And so these were activities where they were competing with countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, and other countries. Uh, so these were very, very footloose activities. And I've done quite a bit of research demonstrating actually that these activities were much more elastic to uh, tariff shocks than other types of uh, activities. Um, you can see this very well by the fact that processing trade in China was just until uh, actually quite recently was extremely important with more than 50 percent of Chinese exports being processing exports where only the final assembly was being done and the rest was value of imported components that came from other countries. But since 1980s, 1990s, China has kind of started doing different types of activities. Initially they were doing assembly of less sophisticated um, um, uh, products. So they were doing a lot of textiles and a lot of footwear and all these things. But uh, one thing that they've been doing over time is increasingly moving into uh, more sophisticated industries. Uh, so Danny Roderick wrote a paper about 10 years ago where he indicated that if you look at China's export bundle about 12, 13 years ago, that it looked very similar to that of developed countries because they had such a high share of high technology exports. It didn't mean that they were making the high technology products, but they had started moving away from assembly of low tech products toward high tech products. Another thing that China's been doing is they've been quality upgrading. They've been within industries moving towards more complex products, uh, still doing the assembly, but just moving into more complex products. So um, the fact that the final assembly um, of the Apple phones was in China uh, actually is an indication that they were moving into high-tech sectors but also within the high-tech sector they were doing labor-intensive activities for the more complex products as well. But this is actually not where it ended so beyond industry upgrading, quality upgrading, China has also increasingly uh, moving, been moving away from uh, final assembly toward producing inputs. And so here's a very nice example uh, that I just found recently, but if you want to find more hard empirical evidence of this, there's a very nice paper by Qian Tang in the American Economic Review. It just demonstrates um, what is being done um, of the Apple iPhone in China. 
and so there's this very famous paper, uh, other paper, uh, that demonstrated that in 2009, China was just doing a very small proportion of um, uh, the value creation, where they were just doing the final assembly. If you look in 2018, it is really not the case they're just doing final assembly. A lot of the components, the key components in the Apple iPhone are being done in China. A very big chunk of value added is being done in China as well. Beyond that, it's not just that they are not just doing final assembly and they're moving into input production. Another thing that is, um, is, is really important is that China has been increasingly moving into orchestration activities within the value chain. So again, I've got a paper here with a lot of empirical evidence of this, but what we demonstrate in the paper is that in the beginning, China was doing what people call toll manufacturing. A foreign company gives them inputs and tells them, do the manufacturing, and then once you've done it, we will take it back. There's not much more going on. Right now, China is almost doing no more toll manufacturing, and almost all what they're doing in this processing export sector is what we call contract manufacturing. A foreign company still goes to them and says, can you do the assembly for us? But then tells them, and beyond that, can you please also make sure you can find the input suppliers, do the financing of the upstream value chain, uh, do all the stockage, do quality insurance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's many, many more services that they are moving into uh, as well. So what this all kind of indicates, uh, so as a result of that, what you're finding out is that um, domestic value added in Chinese exports is rising quite rapidly uh, to kind of uh, go further about what, what uh, Peter Leach was uh, indicating. The macroeconomic implications of this are quite big, and so people are actually indicating that the um, global trade slowdown that we saw after the Great Recession, where the growth of, of trade has been growing, uh, has been slower than that of GDP, that actually this alone uh, explains a very big chunk of wh why this is the case. Okay? So, China's processing exports, we saw that it was uh, about 50% until 2009. This has been going down quite significantly as well. So it all kind of demonstrates that China is just not this final assembler anymore. They are moving into other value chain activities. So what are the implications? This is my last slide. What it just kind of means is that um, uh, the way we think about China today is, is not anymore how it is. So China is no longer, has never been a, uh, a, the factory of the world. Uh, they were more the final assembler, but even that is not the case anymore. They've more moved toward being an input producer and GVC orchestrator. Um, and this is really important because given that they are moving into activities that are more difficult to replicate and as a result more, are, are less substitutable, the pressure that a trade war puts onto China um, is much less significant. Um, and so this reduces a bit the bargaining power of the United States. It doesn't mean they have no bargaining power, but it's, it's a little bit less. Beyond that, the fact that they are not doing final assembly anymore, and they're moving production to Vietnam uh, and other places for final assembly, means that, I mean, the U.S. can put um, uh, tariffs onto China, but a lot of companies are just kind of naturally deviating around it and going through Vietnam where uh, these tariffs just don't have an impact on Chinese exports uh, as much. So, so all this is, is very important to understand where we're going further in the trade war. So one thing for sure we can say is that um, against China, uh, a trade war might have been easy to win before, but now it certainly is no longer easy. afternoon for me as well. Um, I will conclude uh, the presentations by getting even more specific. Uh, Peter Buckley um, talked in his presentation about the middle <laughs> deal here. Uh, the fact that we now have firms, firms controlling global value chains, 
that are between the drivers and the outcomes if you look at it from uh, a policy perspective. So from a government perspective, there is, firms have obviously always been there, but if you think about any basic dimension of, of external policy of the country, so trade and investment, until maybe 15, 20 years ago, this was much more straightforward. Trade statistics still represented in a more real fashion uh, some real truths about the competitiveness of a country. Now, of course, we know that trade statistics tell us almost nothing because it is much of it uh, internal firm, internal trade, um, and we have value-added statistics on trade that, that help a little bit, but this trade still contributes to the external uh, position of the country, so it contributes uh, to the balance of payments. And in some cases, in the case of the United States, this is perceived uh, to be a problem. Uh, in other cases, like Germany that I will talk about, um, it's perceived to be a problem in the other direction, uh, being a surplus country. But the main issue here is that firms are now between the ability of countries to um, effectively execute policy. They are in a completely different domain than they were before, and Peter Leach was also referring to this. Uh, the complex task of governments to actually respond to this reality uh, is something that, that, increased, uh, that, that interests me a great deal. And I like to sort of start to deal with these things um, Peter provided the theoretical background, so the decisions that firms make in the middle are about internalization and about location. So they, it's a question of information. Uh, those decisions are based on the firm's ability to get information and they make decisions on how to coordinate and where to locate the activities. Um, when I think about these things, I like to sort of start with um, looking at statistics and trying to see what is available. So in the latest uh, World Development Report uh, that was also focused on GDC growth, uh, and one uh, piece of statistics that they had and a little exercise that they did uh, was that they sort of showed that trade agreements have gotten more complex. They cover more areas than before uh, and that higher integration in GVCs is related to the more comprehensive trade agreements. So this is one dimension of how governments have been trying to facilitate the growth of GVCs. Then I looked at a report by McKinsey uh, Global Institute and they did quite an interesting exercise um, about GVCs and, and globalization in transition. And many of these things, of course, we know. There is a declining intensity of trade in goods, but there is an increasing intensity of trade in services. And particularly, servitization, which I refuse to believe is a word, uh, but apparently refers to the increasing value added from services that is related to, to manufacturing. Um, we have more intra-regional trade. That's been a trend for a long time, but that is intensifying. And it will also be relevant to the German component of the of the story that I'm telling today. There's, of course, more knowledge intensity uh, in the trade and in these value chains, and that's something that Ari was referring to with respect to, to China, and it's obviously something that a country like Germany uh, that is technologically advanced is concerned with. Now, here's a fun bubble graph. So if we start with uh, the EU28, uh, ignore the timeline because that's an animation, uh, but this represents the end result in 2017. So the bubbles kind of show uh, how the exports and imports of the EU28 have evolved over time. Uh, the brown bubbles at the bottom are uh, Asia, including China. The yellow bubbles are China alone, just to you know, draw out the individual contribution of China. And basically, anything below the line represents uh, uh, countries or regions with which the European Union has a deficit and anything above the line um, would then be a, a, a surplus. So uh, basically exports to um, North America and to the United States, the European Union typically has a, a positive balance. Overall, as you know, the EU28 is roughly in balance in terms of its external trade, so more or less um, a zero balance. We've heard in Europe in recent years uh, different kinds of voices that express concern about these VUCA factors. Uh, there are, of course, many different VUCA factors out there, so the, the trade war is one. Uh, Peter Leach was making reference to uh, externalities, global climate change, uh, issues of that order. 
Uh, but there are also very specific issues that really fall in the realm of sovereignty and protectionism versus openness and how should you react to um, competition that is coming from countries that are perhaps perceived to be unfair. Uh, so unfairness in particular has been associated with the participation of state-owned enterprises. So there have been calls to have more explicit rules uh, concerning state-owned enterprises. And tomorrow morning I'll be talking about the um, FDI review regulations in Germany, uh, but that's one theme that, that has um, entered in there as well. The Germans are particularly concerned about industrial uh, value adding and maintaining uh, and, and keeping industrial value adding. And on the other hand, the EU Commission on its own has expressed the concern that they don't have enough of a toolbox to actually deal with distortive effects of governments that um, <coughs> intervene in one way or another in their economies. Now, if I then shift over to Germany from Europe as a whole, uh, then Germany is a, a surplus country. This is the red bubbles are European trade, but that is um, extra, so not including the EU28. Now, here again, of course, it's important to remember that for most European countries, the intra-European trade is bigger than the extra-European trade. The only exceptions to that are the UK and Ireland. So arguably, if anybody could afford to decouple from the rest of Europe, that would be the, the, the United Kingdom. Uh, all other countries have substantially larger trade within the intra-EU28 group. And I think that's something to, to keep in mind when we consider what the threats are and what the possible um, policy responses might be. Now, what has the German government actually done? It has done four different things. First of all, like all developed governments, it supports innovation through various different kinds of subsidy and training programs. Germany has been extremely busy, not now, but about 20 years ago, uh, signing bilateral investment treaties. Uh, it's actually signed the most number of bilateral treaties, so 130 of them. It has now introduced a new industrial strategy, 2030, uh, and this is industrial policy 2.0, so this is new generation industrial policy. Um, it is not law, it is a strategy paper that the government has published and they've just done that uh, in November. And Germany has adjusted its FDI screening mechanism, which I won't have time to get into here, um, but that is part of the package. Now, of course, the reason for that is that it's one of the most active countries participating in GDCs. The United States is obviously, China is, uh, but Germany is a major trading economy, and it's very concerned about um, these uh, threats. Uh, the changes to the innovation system are very standard, so these are not really anything that you wouldn't see in other countries. The, the apprenticeship, the training programs in Germany are well known. There's nothing very um, exciting in this one. But then we get to the BITs. Um, the BITs will be replaced in time with European uh, BITs, but that process will take quite a long time. So as and when the EU negotiates new agreements, the old German ones will expire, but the reality is that a lot of the German ones, because there are so many, will remain in power, and some of them are quite old-fashioned, considering the, the demands of the environment today. Uh, so for instance, they don't include any um, uh, state investor dispute settlement clauses, which would be normally in the new generation of agreements. So this is a little bit of a liability, uh, but it shows the active role of the German government in trying to create uh, good conditions for German firms. Now, is that a timer for me? <laughs> the new industrial strategy uh, is in response to uh, several kind of numbered uh, issues. So unequal rules of the game, higher protectionism, slowdown, digital transformation, they identify both uh, kind of intrinsic reasons, so technological change, digitalization, the new kind of manufacturing economy, plus political risks uh, like trade wars, Brexit, uh, and then climate change as a separate issue. And they have actually issued a new Made in Germany national industrial strategy. Now, what does that actually contain? Um, in addition to the rules on FDI, uh, there are four things that they are tinkering with, all of which I find 
they are quite detailed, but I find them quite interesting. So the first one is that countries have always had uh, rules uh, on technology transfer to third countries. Uh, so there have always been some limitations on particular technologies that were developed with government support. Now, as I just showed you, the government is putting quite a bit of money and effort into supporting uh, the innovation system, and therefore they have quite a substantial stake in trying to monitor where the fruits of that investment actually go. And they are presently revising those rules uh, in terms of the time frames, but also uh, in terms of the content of the rules. The second one uh, is the foreign trade law, which includes the, the investment provisions. And there, a main change has been to lower the threshold uh, of uh, acquisitions when they uh, come under the purview of the rules. So it used to be 25%, it's now 10%. Uh, for a whole range of industries. There's only uh, a subsection left that is 25%. So they have made it more sensitive. They are also now taking into account cumulative um, ownership changes. So not just one-time ownership changes, but cumulative uh, ownership changes. The thir third and the fourth one I find um, even more interesting because they are now actively uh, trying to find ways in which they would encourage white knight uh, support in case of acquisitions that might fall into areas that they feel are sensitive uh, in terms of technology. You may remember that there were a few quite well-known cases in Germany, one involving KUKA, uh, which is a robotics company, a few years back, uh, which was in 2016. That was before the government had actually looked at uh, the present set of rules. And there's been quite a bit of um, seller's remorse rather than buyer's remorse uh, after the fact because it's thought that that was perhaps an acquisition that, that should have never gone through from a public policy perspective. Um, and the fourth one is basically saying, well, if all else fails and the white knights are not working, then what we might try is actually a temporary state acquisition. And they did this uh, with an acquisition that was uh, meant to take um, a part stake in uh, Eurogrid, which is part of the electricity transmission network uh, in Europe. And they actually used a state bank. Uh, this is the uh, reconstruction bank uh, of Germany. Um, and they used it to temporarily buy off, sort of competitively buy off the stake so that uh, this electricity distributor couldn't be acquired. And this is now something that they want to actually establish as one tool in the toolkit uh, in order to, to deal with these kinds of acquisitions uh, in the future. Now, I give these examples because I think that this dilemma for governments um, is so acute, and of course, you know, Peter Kindly already mentioned that you know, we have a new journal that deals with these issues. We have, in fact, uh, uh, a special issue that deals with these issues. Ari is one of the editors of that special issue and that still has a submission timeline that is open. Uh, so until March, March 1st, you can submit full papers on this issue. And the goal is precisely to begin to deal with the issue that while we in IB tend to look at the firm point of view and we say how do firms adjust to these uncertainties, there is a corresponding, you know, mirror uncertainty on the policymaker's side on how do we adjust policies given the adjustment that the firms make. Uh, and given what the, the previous speaker said, I was, of course, watching TV um, the other day looking at the election results. They were interviewing a, a British business person uh, saying, well, what do you think now? And he says, well, but it's good, you know, now we have, we have some certainty, we are moving on, we know what's happening. And then the interviewer said, yes, but don't you think this will be very bad, it, it, the uncertainty about the rules pertaining to Europe? And he said, no, no, business will find a way. Um, government needs to get out of the way. You know, we need to get this deal done. And I can fully understand his sentiment. So uncertainty, of course, is, is bad for investment. At the same time, I thought, maybe that is true for his business, but it's assuming a great deal of substitutability between different sources of supply, of depends, of course, entirely on the industry, uh, but we've, we have so much research on location specificity of certain activities, of the importance of co-location, on the uh, geographic specificity of certain innovative activities, and I thought, 
it's kind of brave to, to assume that the adjustment will be carried out by firms without too much friction. I think firms actually need governments quite desperately uh, in their corner in this time, but the information problem is a mirror problem on both sides. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you. Oh, we said done an answer. That's the really yeah, yeah. thing. That's brilliant. Okay, we've had a range of presentations there, and we're happy to take any questions or any <laughs> points that uh, there are on rising from global value chains, and particularly the area perhaps of uh, policy and the role of government policy. Jose. So, I mean, 
very interesting literature on uh, systems integration, um, where you have a lead firm, and lead firm is working with a whole system that together are making a product. And so the question is, how do you make sure that all these companies that are, are not owned by the same company, that um, the bottlenecks that having this whole system working together uh, can be resolved? And so the whole question is, what type of knowledge should the lead firm have in order to get rid of the bottlenecks at the moment that they uh, arrive? And so this literature kind of indicates that lead firms need to know more than they think. Uh, uh, so they actually need to know the technological particularities of many of their suppliers, not because they're making that component themselves, but if there is a, an issue of how to integrate a component into the final product, that then um, you have the knowledge of how to do that. And so, so now this kind of work, I'm doing this with, uh, with Ramadami and, uh, and, and Catherine Spadina. Uh, so we're actually trying to find out what the different dimensions are of what lead firms need to know in order to play this orchestration role in global value chains uh, that are being spread more and more across different countries um, and that are less and less open. So who is really the beneficiary? 
2016 was the peak year. We've only had about five years, really, of, of these Chinese acquisitions, you know, uh, more intensive. Nothing has happened, except that these firms have received lots of new capital. They've actually expanded their operations. Management stays the same. The name on the, on the door stays the same. They've not had any reasons. They've, if anything, they've had their job secured uh, by the new owners. The sellers are happy because they, are, they haven't found a suitable second generation follower for the business, so they are finding a very good buyer. The only ones who are not happy <laughs> are the policymakers of the government because they look at what is the cumulative impact when we are selling away. And hookah was really the case where there was a lot of regret afterwards uh, of we should have had something in place that would have allowed us uh, to look at this. But these are such new issues. I mean, 10 years ago, no one talked about FDI screening as actually being something that governments have to be engaged with. And then it comes back to the information question. With what information are we going to screen? And that's not just a uh, that's not just a Chinese, German, high tech industrial phenomenon. I mean, in, my, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, East, Chinese investment has been seeking out you know, dairy farming, mining investment, other agricultural investment. Just, you, know, you see the interviews with uh, you know the, the the dairy farmers, and they're welcoming the capital because the management. Are saying, as Sariana is saying, there are more people in town. You know, the potential is for more guaranteed longevity of employment. Um, but then there'll be a silent report, like your one example, and and, and uh, the bells ring. You know? So uh, it's not just high tech. You know, uh, in, in Europe, it's, it's elsewhere. Thank you. 
politicians will be very uh, skeptical of using the word tax uh, because uh, that uh, is never being uh, portrayed well. So um, there have been some things that have happened in order to make companies responsible for their own waste. So for example, in Belgium, but in, in, in Europe in general, uh, so in the white goods sector, um, there is a requirement that producers of white goods are uh, have to take back the product afterwards and have to do the recycling of the products themselves. So by making the companies responsible, they actually um, have, have forced uh, um, uh, different organizations in different countries to find ways how to do this without hurting them, themselves too much. In Belgium, for example, what they decided to do was create an organization that does all the collecting, and then they just charge a higher price themselves onto uh, the consumers. So instead of having the government uh, in the taxes, it's the companies that are asking for a higher price and then doing it themselves. So they There is a time dimension to this as well. 
there must be something, but not direct investor state uh, in the dispute settlement. So I'm guessing there's some kind of an arbitration clause. You can take it to the people in Stockholm or, or the whoever they are, who are, yeah, which are actually kind of 